Pankaj Kumar, founder of this page Theatricology. Before I start of this speech, I want to share one thing that I have created this page for you people. If you are a member of this page, now you are connected to more than 100 countries. And one day, it will be very informative for you. Thanks Dr. Antony Mashido sir for arranging such a nice meet and Dr. Mark for choosing such a controversial but very informative topic on uh, pre-operative androgen stimulation on hypospadial surgery. Uh, thank you Dr. Hadidi for uh, sharing his experience on use of um, uh, flaps in distal hypospadias and mid penile hypospadias. It is a very basic topic. And uh, third speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Krish Long. He will give uh, a speech talk on uh, documentation of your work for better hyperspadious outcome. I think it will be very informative for you people. All the best for today's meet. Thank you. Okay. Alrighty. Yes. Okay, so I'll make a brief introduction until uh, our friends uh, Luis Braga and uh, Pankaj Kumar join us. But uh, okay. I would like to thank you all for this possibility. It was by coincidence. I had uh, for short in Brazil uh, one uh, situation that allowed us to make a like, conference inside the Brazilian pediatric urology community. And it was a major success, uh, basically because of these times we're living with the coronavirus. And that, that came the opportunity to expand these uh, meetings we are doing in Brazil. And then I got the idea to invite the guys, the experts in hypospadias. And uh, it was a pleasure that you accepted at first moment. And it was also very nice that uh, Dr. Pankaj uh, Kumar from India who holds this uh, amazing uh, group uh, and he uh, managed to advertise this uh, meeting and it's a worldwide meeting right now so thank you very much mark thank you ahmed thank you chris thank you luis braga for this opportunity and uh, i'd like you to start uh, until luis braga join us to keep moderated okay so mark you can start. Thank you very much again. Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, this is a reiteration of a talk I gave at the Hypospadias International Society meeting uh, this past October. So for those of you who haven't heard it, uh, welcome. For those of you that had, this will uh, kind of give you a reminder. <laughs> So this is, uh, there's a lot of controversy going on regarding testosterone usage. And since I am a big user of testosterone, I wanted to look at the literature and I wanted to compare my results using testosterone to see what the story is. And you can make your own conclusions after this talk, but uh, I'm going to give you my prejudices and what the literature says. So... The people that like testosterone, like myself, like the fact that it increases vascularity and increases specifically the gland size, which is the biggest thing I'm interested in, especially for distal hypospadias, but it does also increase penile size. People that don't like, and, and I believe, frankly, because of that, that it promotes better outcomes. Detractors will state that there's higher complication rates with poor wound healing, but is that really true? So I looked at some uh, salient papers that question the benefits of testosterone and were concerned with increased complication rates. So here's one, one of the earlier ones by Gordoza that looked at androgen stimulation prior to hypospadias surgery. And unfortunately, it was a relatively small study. There were many different techniques used in multiple surgeons. So it was very hard to draw conclusions from this study. But nonetheless, the authors concluded that there was a risk of poor wound healing secondary to androgen pre-op administration. And they were concerned about this enough to recommend prospective studies going forward. And then Menon in 2017 had a paper looking at outcome of urethroplasty after uh, giving parenteral testosterone in children with distal hypospadias. 
and looked at 94 patients, which was a decent number, and looked specifically at histology of testosterone uh, patients, which showed increased vascularity and angiogenesis. They also noted that the patients receiving testosterone had more post epidema and inflammation. And for whatever reason, they saw more wound dehiscence in the kids that they gave testosterone. The bottom line is that the clinical results in the study were not statistically significant, although the authors concluded uh, that we should urge caution in using testosterone because they had an increased dehiscence rate in their study. So then there's some background noise. I don't know if I can... Stop. Yes, I think it's from Braga, but I already cut it. Okay. Again. So then there's a paper by Chen looking at oral testosterone uh, for severe hypospadias. And they looked at outcomes of two-stage proximal repairs uh, between, uh, over roughly a 10-year period. They looked at testosterone levels before and after therapy, as well as penile length, diameter, and secondary effects. And their conclusion, interestingly, was that testosterone was effective in enhancing penile growth, which we know, but they had lower complications in the testosterone group. Then there's the paper of Asgari looking specifically at IM testosterone administration prior to hypospadis repair. And this is one of the first prospective randomized controlled studies. So they reviewed their clinical practice in patients receiving preoperative testosterone compared to controls. And they did specifically only tip procedures, which I don't do at all. Um, and nobody at CHOP does the tip. Um, so the hypospadiases in this, this series were all distal or mid-shaft with flat urethral plates. And his conclu their conclusion were that pre op testosterone appeared to actually decrease complication rates, reduce the need for reoperation, and resulted in better cosmesis. Then there's the paper of Babu. So now we're getting two sides of the coin here. And he again looked at the role of intraoperative testosterone preoperatively and looking at outcomes. Again, another prospective randomized study. In this case, he looked at 200 patients over a three year period. Again, all of them received the, had the TIP procedure. Uh, 92 didn't receive testosterone and 92 received testosterone. And interestingly, his results showed a higher number of parent satisfaction in the testosterone group regarding cosmesis versus the no testosterone group. And interestingly, the total complications were significantly less in the testosterone group, which was 17% versus in the, uh, in the testosterone group versus the non-testosterone group, which had a 50% complication rate. So my personal experience, and it's significantly larger than this, but this is uh, back uh, almost a year ago now. Uh, we looked at 250, our researchers at CHOP, looked at 250 consecutive distal hypospadias repairs that I performed. And I did strictly the tiers to play on these cases. Every one of them got testosterone. They received 25 milligrams five weeks pre-op and two weeks uh, pre-op, I am and follow-up was 13 months, we had three complications, and that included a suture tract, one partial gland dehiscence, and one meatal stenosis. So the total complication rate in my series was 1.27%. Interestingly, the national complication rate for distal hypospadias repairs is 9%. So keep that in mind, and I'm a ubiquitous user of testosterone. So what do we know about testosterone presently? Well, we do know that the half-time post-injection is eight days. We know it enhances the glands and the penile shaft. And in my personal experience, the average glands width went from 11 millimeters pre-stimulation to 17 millimeters post-stimulation and clearly increased the penile vascularity. So looking at some studies uh, regarding microdensity of the hypospadias prep use, Cagri uh, found that there was decreased microvessel density in hypospadias prep use compared to normals. And the more proximal the defect, the less the microvessel uh, density. Then there was a study by Bastos looking at structural 
uh, grape juice, looking at uh, alterations in vascularization. And he looked specifically histologically, looking at the effect of testosterone on neovascularization. He gave 1% testosterone ointment. So as you notice, as I'm going through these papers, some are giving ointments, some are giving shots. It's all over the place. Um, but they're using preoperative testosterone ointment, and they found that there was neovascularization in absolute numbers compared to controls, approximately a two to one difference. There was also increased la labeling of WVF in the prep use in boys with hypospadias who received testosterone, which is a very important finding when considering there's an inverse relationship between vascularization and inflammation and fibrosis. And then finally, Ishi talks about uh, the uh, effect of IM testosterone on stretch penile length with hypospadias. And uh, he looked at 17 boys who got two to three injections and found that the mean penile length increased one centimeter. But the other thing that I thought was interesting with this study, which kind of helped me in determining how I was going to give my testosterone, was that the effect of penile length in this study did not significantly correlate with age, body surface area, uh, or penile length before treatment, suggesting that one could use 25 milligram dosage irregardless or irrespective of the um, BSA or penile length. So what don't we know? We don't know testosterone tissue levels in the penile skin at the time of surgery. We don't know tissue levels in the tunic albuginea and androgen receptors in the ventrum and laterally at the time of corporoplasty for proximal hypospadias. And uh, we're learning now with some studies, the blood serum levels of testosterone at the time of surgery in patients receiving testosterone compared to pre-op. And my hypothesis was that because I wait two weeks from the time of my last dose, that if we did a serum level of testosterone before uh, we gave it, and then at the time of surgery, that it would equal or be very close to the preoperative level. So at CHOP, our practice is to give 25 milligrams IM in the thigh five weeks pre-op and repeat this two weeks pre-op. So here's this study um, by uh, Saka Kibara, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, this was done uh, actually a couple of decades ago, but what was interesting was that he uh, looked specifically at plasma testosterone measurements via immunoassay at seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. And he was giving the testosterone ointment every single day for three weeks. And then he operated within a week of the completion of stimulation. So if you look at this, the pre-stimulation testosterone was 11.5 nanograms per deciliter. At seven days, it had increased to 65.6. At day 14, it had gone up even more. And at day 21, it kind of natured at 78.9. But seven days later, the number dropped to 15.7. So if you would imagine, I'm doing these 14 days later, and the pre-stimulation is 11.5, I think you would agree that most likely the, the day of surgery would be pretty close to this number. So I've been talking a lot about who, why I use testosterone or why I like it and, and looked at different papers, but who might not need testosterone? Well, patients that undergo the MATU procedure, which Dr. Hadidi will talk about. Frankly, most patients that undergo TIPS don't need testosterone because you're making your incision right at the urethral edge of the urethral plate. Uh, patients who have island onlay or island pedicle flaps and patients who undergo the SLAM technique, which is one of Dr. Hadidi's uh, techniques. So what do these patients have in common? The size of the glands is not as critical to achieve a successful outcome. When you're doing the tears, you need a, a good sized glands because you're going to be going quite lateral to the urethral plate. So how good is the literature? Well, overall, most of the literature is of poor quality with many retrospective studies involving heterogeneous groups, time of stimulation, and type of hormones used. There's a scarcity of randomized controlled trials that are largely underpowered. There's very poor criterion for patient selection. And there's a miscellany of drugs and doses, routes of administration, and length of treatment. 
So Dr. Braga and company uh, did a massive uh, meta-analysis uh, to look at all of this and uh, summarize the effects of hormonal stimulation and complication rates, specifically looking at proximal repairs. So they data mined literature over a period of 20 years and performed a meta-analysis. There were 288 citations, and interestingly, only 11 of them met the inclusion criteria, as most of these studies were retrospective and of low quality. And 45% had preoperative testosterone. So what were their conclusions? Well, if the patient received pre-op testosterone, the odds ratio for a complication was 1.67. So their conclusion was that the published literature was of poor quality, lacked standardized reporting of important patient and surgical details, hence the effect of testosterone stimulation remained unclear. So what's the clinical bottom line in my hands? Testosterone in my hands is a useful adjunct for correcting hypospadias, especially in the case of the smaller glands for those of us who do not perform the TIP procedure but instead perform the tears to play. Clinical results in my hands have been superior to that in the literature for distal repairs using testosterone ubiquitously and thus refutes the anti-testosterone literature. Thank you for your time and I'll turn it back to my colleagues. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dr. Luis Braga has joined us who has been our moderator today. So, uh, I don't know, Luis, if you can make a brief comment uh, concerning uh, Mark's uh, lecture. And uh, we'll make the discussion at the end. So, you can uh, make a brief comment and then you can hold it to uh, Ahmed. Uh, I try to control the microphones. Only the speakers and moderators have their microphones open. So, please uh, uh, try not to have. Uh, noise from outside, but Luis, you can do your comments and uh, moderate the session for now. Th thank you, Macero. Uh, and then, so I think what I would like to say, a great presentation, Mark, is that, uh, and I think this uh, uh, will go to support his um, talk. So we repeated that, uh, or we updated that systematic review uh, five years later. And then um, because, uh, like uh, Mark showed, there are many studies that have been published. So what we saw when we look at just observational studies, uh, there are actually there was an association between testosterone and worse outcomes after hypospadias. But when we did a subgroup analysis, just looking at the randomized clinical trials, because at that point, more trials had come up, actually, uh, because, you know, with RCTs, you can adjust for the confounding effect and then the selection bias that happens with administration of testosterone. Actually, testosterone was beneficial. So maybe that's why Mark sees good results with his um, cases because actually uh, a direct uh, uh, worse outcome with testosterone has not been uh, encountered when you adjust for all the confounding variables that are present in observational studies. That was my comment that uh, uh, when you read the literature, you have to really being able to see what's going on in the studies because they are not of good quality. And then the information that you can get from them may not be uh, the most accurate one. Great. Thanks, okay, Ahmed, I think you, we are all seeing your slides. So you can take the, take okay. the control. First, I'd like to thank you all for your kind invitation. And it's very important to have such scientific meetings even during the COVID crisis. And I'm sorry to mention that we lost a very, uh, I don't know why it's not running. Uh, I'll try again. Well, uh, be, until you manage, I have just noticed that I, I probably have a limitation to 100 people. And I'm really sorry about that because I, I didn't check it. Uh, and now I'm, I'm noticing that we are have 100 participants for a long time. Anyway, the meeting will be recorded and uh, available. And maybe I will check uh, if we can over uh, expand the capacity of this hall 
But uh, as you see here, it's 100 participants for a long time. That's something I just realized yeah, right now. So Ahmed, go ahead. Uh, so because of the COVID uh, crisis, I'm sorry to mention that we lost a very dear colleague, Professor Hisham Eseke, who succumbed due to COVID uh, virus last Friday. He was a dear colleague. He was active in the HLIS Society. He was the vice dean of the faculty of medicine, and he's probably the first pediatric surgeon I know of who suffered and died because of this. I wish you all to pray for him. Now, Antonio asked me to talk about flaps in high procedure surgery. So I looked in the dictionary to see that what is the definition of flaps and grafts. And flap is a tissue transferred with its original blood supply intact. Whereas a graft is tissue or skin that has been completely detached and has to develop new blood supply from the recipient area. When I was a young resident in plastic surgery, I was a little bit confused and my consultant told me this, Ahmed, grafts are the tissues that you try to bring to life, whereas flaps are living tissues that you try not to bring to death. So this may help our younger colleague to understand the difference between flaps and grafts. Could I ask maybe Lewis, could you think, mention one or two techniques for hyperspadias who are not using flaps? What do you think, Lewis? Or Antonio, anybody? Okay, many people may think that the tip technique is not a flap. But if we review what we do in the tip technique, this is the eraser plate, you divide it in the middle and you mobilize it both sides. So you are actually a tip technique is in fact a flap with intact blood supply. Not only this, according to the description of the technique, which I do not do and I do not recommend, you also cover it with a protective layer from reproducial fascia. And this is again another facial flap. So when you look, think of it, the probably only technique that is, may not be considered a flap is probably the original tears. Now I will talk about flaps in, in, according to these points. What are the essentials to have a successful hyperspadias repair? The these include tissue handling, core correction, well vascularized tissue, wide urethra, protective intermediate layer, and to have a slit like meters, and definitely you need to have a long term follow up. Now, tissue handling should not be underestimated or under evaluated. Gentle tissue handling makes a major difference to the outcome. The more uh, vigorous you are with the tissues, the more chances that you will have a complication. I think we all know that. I would like to handle the point of Cordy in two points. Should we do only ventral degloving or complete degloving? I'm aware that most surgeons do complete degloving. I do not recommend this because number one, you increase the edema and swelling after OP if you leave the uh, foreskin. And if you excite the foreskin, you burn your bridges. And number two, you should give the parents the chance or the option if they opt for foreskin reconstruction. This is very important because we don't know when we start the operation for sure which technique we will have to use. And unless you have the foreskin to make your proper choice, you may not have be able to do the flap technique that is suitable for your patients. We all know that most of the distal hyperspadias have mild or superficial cordy, like what you see here. And if you incise the skin, 
just proximal to the maintenance as we do here, you would have a corrected the curvature of the penis. But we all know that some cases that may present like distal hyperspadius, they may have severe D for D and you may have actually when you incise, do your subcoronal incision and you want to excise the, all the hypoplastic tissue, the meters may go as down as the proximal hypo or periscotal junction. Because of a presentation a few days ago, I have to stress the fact that penile curvature does not cause fistula. What may cause fistula is the cause of cordy. We all know that cordy is related to hypoplastic atritic ventral tissue that needs to be excised and should not be used to form the new urethra. We all know about Pierre Moyquin hypothesis, which is actually true about the delta or triangle if you do lines from the edges of the foreskin defect, this area has a little vascularity and is hypoplastic and you should not use to make the urethra repair. This is not a hypothesis, this is a fact. This is a longitudinal section in 15 weeks embryo and you see the tissues how it is. When you get the cut section, this is the haphazard disorganized uh, tissue of the urethra plate as compared to a normal urethra plate. So the message is you have to correct the cordy and you have to use healthy vascular, well vascularized tissue. Now for flaps, for example, if you do a slam or whatever, usually you should elevate the fascia with the flap. Now, in some cases, you will find the fascia or the corpus spongiosum under the skin is thin or not well vascularized. In that case, you should make sure that you take a good vascularized protective intermediate layer. So this is this classic material, no severe CODD. You elevate the, the flap and you see how thick it is. Now, in case this is thin and not well vascularized, you can actually take the reputed fascium in from here without excising the foreskin, as I showed in the Congress in Frankfurt, and you just leave the foreskin and you dissect the dartus fascia off the foreskin and the skin of the penis. If you are doing a mid penile hyperspadius, you can have it from the tunica vaginalis from the scrotum, and this is how it looks like. We have always to remember building the new urethra is like building a house. You must have good building materials, otherwise the house or in our case, new urethra will collapse. This is an example of a 16 years old boy who had about 20 operations. This is where he passes urine. These tissues are scarred unhealthy but the body of the penis, as you see here, once you excise all the unhealthy scar tissue is straight. I didn't do a dorsal plication, I only excise the unhealthy tissue. Now, obviously in such case, I do not have enough skin because the patient was circumcised, so I had to use here skin graft. The fourth important point is to make a wild urethra. Now, in about 85% of my patients, I could easily put a catheter size 12 in the proximal urethra. Now, if the proximal urethra are only size 12, there is, doesn't make sense that you make a new urethra around a catheter size 6. So, in the 15% where the proximal urethra does not accommodate size 12, I made a wide urethra, but I take it out the size 12 catheter and put a narrower catheter into the bladder. As you see in all my repairs, you'll find such a thick catheter going through the urethra. Now, there are some people suggesting that if you have a fistula, the likely chance is because of cordy. This is simply untrue. 
The most common cause for occurrence of fistula is narrow distal urethra. This is a child who had a tip repair, has repaired three times, and still passing urine from here. Now, in roots and incised urethra, new urethra, you see that the new urethra after the tip incision is only less than three millimeter in width. That would not even accommodate size six catheter. So the most common cause of recurrence of fistula is narrow distal new urethra. This is another child who came to me from another country with a suprapubic catheter, looks very beautiful, but simply he cannot pass urine. And because the tissues are unhealthy and swollen, the first step I had to do is to incise the narrow urethra, let it settle down before I make a slam uh, flap. You see the difference how he came to me with angry looking, swollen, uh, red penis, and how it looks like before I make the new urethra six months later. This is another case and the same problem with narrow, you see the incision of the tip procedure. And I had to see how wide I had to take a flap here. And this is how it looks like at the end of the procedure. The fifth point is very important to have a protective intermediate layer. You should avoid having two suture lines on top of each other. These are the possible flaps that you, facial flaps you may use. Now, this is another point I have to mention. One of the important things to avoid two suture lines on top of each other. And one way to do that is to take a rotational flap. This is drawn by the artist, but in reality, you, this is the incision that you do to take, to correct the fistula. And all you need to do is to put, extend your subcoronal incision on one side, and then you want to bring this flap here. So you make a release incision here until you can bring this point to here as you see here. You'll end up with a defect here. This point will come here at the end of the operation. All you will have is a normal subcoronal incision and a longitudinal incision just lateral to the midline. So it is not rectangular scar. This just indicates inadequate experience with the principles of plastic surgery. Again, you can take the protective layer from under the skin without excising it. This is, for example, a facial flap that we use. Uh, this is, I think it's called the facial technique to correct rotation of the penis. Now, the next important point is to have a slit like meters. We all look and try to have a slit like meters. But let's think how do we get a slit like meters? If the slit like meters was linked to the incision of the urethra plate, but in fact, it has nothing to do with the incision of the urethra plate. It has to do with the way you close your. Uh, ureth near urethra. The mistake is to close it like here and then you will have here what looks like a fish mouth and this was the case with the original mic here. What you need is that when you close it you make it like a V and when you bring this the glandular flaps uh, wings here you will end up with this slate lock meters. This can be applied to any flap that you choose to make the new urethra. All you need to do is leave two millimeter on either side of the plate and then excise the V here. And when you close this, you end up with this like slit like meters. It has nothing at all to do with the incision of the urethra plate. Now, let's talk about techniques now. I'd just like to show this uh, classification that was mentioned in uh, HIS 2 and 3, and I hope this will become the international standard classification so that we don't continue mixing apples with oranges. 
These are the protocol that I would use in different grades. I use the dig for granular, slam for the distal, labo for proximal, and sedu for perineal or two-stage repair. I will just show that quickly so that I don't overtake the time. This is the classic MITI. The difference between SLAM and classic MITI is this slanting incision here and excision of the V and the quay you close. And I close the flap with three layers. So it is sort of two protective layers. So you don't have two suture lines on top of each other. And I'll just show you this quickly, how it is done. It will only take a minute. I hope I'm not crossing the time yet. You elevate the flap with the fascia, which is actually part of the corpus spongiosa. You see the slanting incision on top. The flap has to be thick. If it is not thick, you have to support it with thick well vascularized protective intermediate layer. You excite the angles of sorrow. And you close it in three layers. Then you excise the V, as I mentioned, to avoid having a fish mouth natus, and you will have a slit lock natus like any known procedure for uh, distal hypospedial repair. As Mark mentioned, you are not bound with the width of the glands, and this is reproducible. This te original technique as well as it's almost 90 years old now. The only main modification of SLAM is to make it have a slit like natus. This is what we end with. See the difference here between the slit like natus with tip, where actually, in fact, the opening is at the coronal sulcus, and with a SLAM where you have it where it should be. Now, this looks like a mid penile hypospedis, or even this, it looks like a subcoronal. But as you see here, the tissues are very thin, and this case is not suitable for a slam or modified material. And this was handled as a proximal hypospedis with labo. Now, let's talk about labo. The idea is with when the opening is proximal, you cannot make a proximal flap like this, otherwise, you'll have skin, uh, hair bearing skin. So why not take it from the side and you have a good blood supply. So you make the incision like this, again, slanted, and bring the lateral penile skin and prepuce to the midline. It will be like this, suture it, and you just close it as you close a book. Again, you have to take a V, and this is animation of the technique. Essentially, instead of prox taking proximal skin like a classic uh, matier or a slam, you take it from natural, and the blood supply is coming from here, from the left side of the penis. <coughs> you close, you excise the V, and you'll have a nice, beautiful, well vascularized, wide, urethra. Now this is only possible if the patient does not have deep OD where you have to incise the urethra plate and excite the hypoplastic tissue. And this is how the natus look like even in a proximal hypospadius. Now the last and very important point is long-term follow-up which I'm sure Chris will talk about. Our standard protocol in Frankfurt, we see the patient three months after surgery, then one year later, then three years later, then five years later, then at the age of 15 years of age. 
So this is, for example, a label, how it looks like four years after surgery. This is after nine years after surgery. And I just want to mention how to use even flaps in urethral structure. This is a 12 years old boy who fell from his bike and he fell on his penis. After a month, he could not pass urine at all from the penis and the surgeon could not introduce a catheter, so he put a suprapubic catheter. I hope when you open here, you see that the catheter introduced from the meters or tip of the penis ended here, and this is about half a centimeter, about eight millimeter of no urethra at all. And when you open it and open the new urethra, this is how it looks like. I have to mobilize urethra to connect them, and the next step is you cannot close it primarily, and you cannot, I didn't put a graph because I prefer flaps. So I use the principle of the label. I suture the skin here with its intact blood supply, and then turn the flap as you do with the label. And this is at the end of the procedure. He had a catheter for 10 days, went home, and this with one year follow up, no complication, and the short time is quite happy. Long term follow up. I noticed in distal forms of hyperspadias, the one year follow up complication is one, five to eight. It is almost double in distal and 50% more in proximal. With perineal hyperspadias, I did not reach 10 years follow up yet. This is picture taken during the Philadelphia meeting with all the pioneers of hyperspadias. I'd like to thank you very much. Those who did not join the Hyperspadia Society, I would like you to join the meeting that will be, is the plan to be held in Vienna in December. If it is not feasible because of the coronavirus, maybe we'll do it virtual online, like what we are doing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Very nice presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll let you, Braga, at the end after this next presentation to start the discussions. And I would like to have Chris Long right now, who is, uh, works with Mark in shop, who was our host in this exceptional meeting we had from the International Hyperspace Society uh, last year. And I would like, uh, Mark, that you introduce Chris for all the audience. And thank you again, Chris, for the joining us and giving your talk. Okay, Mark. Uh, it's all right. No, no introduction needed. Um, I need to, um, Ahmed, I don't know if you can unshare your screen though, so I can share mine. Oh, okay. Hey. You have to unshare yours, uh, Ahmed, so that we can share. Okay. Okay, you can share your, your screen right now, Chris. Okay. Sorry, I think I'm doing this right now. You guys can see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. All right, so hello everyone. Um, like uh, Antonio was saying, I work with Mark over in Philadelphia. So greetings from Philadelphia. Um, the sun finally went down, it was kind of beating on my face. But um, so I'm gonna do something, um, I guess a little bit less technical than what Mark and Ahmed were doing. Um, and basically gonna sort of take a look at sort of a transition to a standardized document template to improve our, our hyperspadious outcomes. So I'm going to start here with just some background information and really just talking about what concerns we have with the hyperspadious literature. I think these are probably pretty common to everyone and really have been brought up a couple times already on this uh, sort of brief discussion. So number one and, and pretty much in the forefront is the variability in the documentation across and within studies. Um, this includes indications for surgery, uh, description of the surgical approach, and also defining complications. Um, this isn't limited to, you know, one institution from another. It can also be even, you know, within an institution. And a big part of the reason why we pushed a CHOP for this sort of standardization was because, you know, we have the 10, 11 surgeons here, and everybody was kind of doing it their own way and documenting it their own way and really couldn't make sense of what was going on and what we were publishing. So that was a big part of this push in terms of doing that. Um, in the literature, there's certainly a lot of underpowered studies. 
Um, and because of that variability I mentioned in the first bullet point, there's an inability to collaborate across institutions, which kind of limits really just the ability to kind of make a lot of conclusions. And the follow-up, uh, I may have just mentioned his follow-up and you know, kind of getting out to that 10-year mark, um, but the vast majority of studies that are out there, this follow-up is incomplete. So <clears throat> we start by really just kind of highlighting a couple, two papers, uh, one from 2015, meta-analysis looking at the you know, complication rates of the tubular rise and size plate. Now they started off with well over 100 sort of, um, 100 papers that they could try and include here, and they narrowed it down to 49 papers, um, and this included around 4,600 patients. Now this is taken verbatim from their paper. Um, they said that, the, that their study was limited in terms of doing a meta-analysis and a proper meta-analysis that uh, Louis already talked about is a lack of a standardized, standardized outcome measure. Um, and uh, they suggested that outcome measures become established as a criteria for acceptance to publication. And here you can see in the next, pay, next line, they put a minimum inclusion criteria and things that you would think would be present in everything, right? So in the ADA location, the degree of Cordy and the repair technique, things that seem basic in terms of, you know, kind of understanding what's going on in the paper. Um, and on top of that, you know, we really lack standardization in terms of defining what a complication should be. Um, so really this is um, kind of a perfect storm in terms of why we can't sort of compare and contrast studies. Um, you know, Dr. Braga might be a little bit familiar with this, but basically this came from the SPU task force on hyperspadius. Uh, this was published a year after that, that first paper, uh, 2016. And really what they were trying to do was to modify the strobe statement to the hyperspadius literature. And if you look at it, it really outlines what a hyperspadius paper should be, what it should include, and really ultimately should be define any paper that gets published. Unfortunately, um, you know, what they found was the majority of the literature was non-randomized in all observational studies, which on a certain level could, you know, provide some input to everyone. But unfortunately, you know, the limitations of uh, those studies were exacerbated by bias and non-standardized structure of the manuscripts. And really what Louis tried to do along with the rest of the group there was um, to try and sort of provide this framework in terms of getting everyone to sort of follow along and, and, and kind of doing the same language. Ahmed already mentioned the HIS sort of uh, international score. And there's also the GMS score and these um, kind of incorporate the location of the urethral hiatus, the degree of cordy, the glands width, and, and sort of some uh, meatal pad, uh, urethral meatus, or, sorry, urethral plate scoring. But, you know, for whatever reason, they're just not widely accepted beyond, you know, a few papers that are out there. So <clears throat> as part of uh, the second sort of iteration of the SPU task force, which is, you know, Mark's the president of, basically we kind of put our heads together and how can we improve these outcomes? And, you know, the two things that really hit home were standardization and collaboration. So we worked with, uh, I'm not sure how familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, how familiar everyone is with EPIC, <coughs> but that's our electronic medical record, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, my goodness. <laughs> it's not coronavirus, is it? Yeah, I don't think so, I don't think so. Mar no one's near me, Mark's, Mark's from away. Um, so maybe I'm just getting choked up because I'm so excited about this uh, thing that we put together. Um, but what you see here on the screen, so this is, um, it looks big and it looks kind of messy, but basically this is what we call a smart form. And really this is just what we have in the operating room. Um, now, this is just for the operating room. We also created something that you would have in the pre-operative area and also for the follow-up. So um, this is just one piece of the puzzle that we have here. But what you see is all those limitations that we had in terms of defining the anatomy and what things look like before the incision and certain sort of parameters of the procedure, it's all included here. And so this is just, again, some of the breakdown of what we have beyond sort of, <clears throat> you know, what the patient name is and date of birth for their age, you know, date of surgery and whether antibiotics were used before surgery, prophylaxis was used, type of anesthesia block. Um, again, you know, we haven't even answered the question of whether a caudal versus a penile block causes a problem. For <laughs> so some of the surgical details we have, you know, is this a, Again, sort of looking back at notes, you know, is this the first time the patient's had surgery? Is it the after a first stage? Is this a complication? You know, we have on here the number of prior hyperspadius repairs, which again is not often explicitly stated in optimums. 
this is the, again, sort of going through some of the anatomic sort of um, uh, assessment here in terms of whether a web penis was there, presence of an undescended testicle, genetic anomaly, again, all these things that if they're not explicitly stated, you really can't ascertain it from the note. And then some specifics about a urethroplasty. So, you know, the exact type of repair that's done, we try to be fairly inclusive in terms of what we have. So the tip, the tip with an inlay, um, you know, the dig repair, first stage repair, the anal base flap, um, you know, there's lots of different names and, you know, you have an other in here. So you have a right in section, um, the layers of the urethroplasty, whether it's a single layer or two layer, again, a bunch of different sort of details that may be important or may not be important. So the nice thing about this is, you know, if you have the electronic medical record and you're able to use Epic, what can happen is this smart form literally auto generates the operative report. So it really makes it easy. So it's a lot of work to go through and do these clicks, but then again, you don't have to go through um, and make your own op note afterwards. And then a workbench report. So let's get into that. So this is the op note. So what you see from that smart form, those little clicks, basically all this information is generated. So this, this patient presented with an uncorrected hypospadias. There were no prior hypospadias repairs. I presented for urethroplasty and glansplasty today. It's nice information and exactly what you need. You know, it might not be the same verbiage that you use in your op note or dictated op note, but this has all that information there. On top of that, this is the workbench report. So what you see here, each line there is basically the output from all the sort of surgical details from the patients that we have. And so what happens is it gives you the location of the urethral meatus, the type of suture to close the glands, you know, what the glands width was before you closed it. And so, again, it automates all of these processes so that it makes it easy, um, you know, because, you know, what you need is you have to have good input in terms of good data. Otherwise, you, your output isn't going to be, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as people like to say. Next step is looking at the universal definitions in terms of what's a complication. Again, getting back to that fister muller uh, sort of paper. Um, you know, what is a complication? So uh, this, this is uh, taken from the most recent Campbell's chapter that Mark and I wrote with uh, Dr. Doug Canning. Um, and so what this is, is just urethroplasty complications. So what one people, you know, particularly for date glands dehiscence, for one person, they might not report glands dehiscence, where, you know, if the glands is, is not completely fused, they don't, you know, they're not going to sort of take it as a complication unless the patient needs another procedure. Medial stenosis is another one that um, it was fairly subjective in terms of how people report it. So we try to put some definitions in here in terms of what actually sort of defines these um, complications and how, again, how people can sort of, for a complication that's down in Brazil or a complication that's over in Germany, is it gonna be the same thing that we're seeing over here in Philadelphia? And again, same thing for skin complications. So <clears throat> Ahmed mentioned this, and, and this is sort of the protocol uh, that we have instituted over the past few years in terms of follow-up. Um, we didn't abide by this, you know, once I started looking uh, at our numbers in terms of what we had, it was very frustrating in terms of number of patients that only had six months of follow-up or nine months of follow-up. Um, and it was a tremendous amount of work in terms of getting patients in for follow-up and really extending them beyond toilet training and beyond puberty um, to really just, because these patients are presenting as adults with complications and things that they were just kind of ignoring. So we're incorporating things like an office Euroflow. Um, the video avoiding if we can. Um, a lot of families seem to have good luck sort of, uh, you know, videoing the patient voiding at home and then kind of bring that in for us. Um, and so, again, we kind of get back to some of the concerns that were raised in those first couple slides in terms of with the literature. And, you know, what this is really guided towards and really meant to hit is, you know, getting rid of that variability in the documentation, you know, and that's exactly what this will do. Um, and in turn, what that will allow for is collaboration. We'll be able to sort of talk across and amongst institutions so we can get rid of these underpowered studies so we can actually make good ones and really answer the questions that we need to hit in order to make better outcomes for these patients. And the lack of long-term follow-up, obviously that's going to take time, but it's also going to take some dedication towards doing that. And I think that this quote is probably, you know, something that looking through the literature and putting things together for that Campbell's chapter and looking at over 500 papers out there in terms of what's out there, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And there's no doubt that we can kind of just continue to sort of, you know, puddle along and, you know, those papers that came out in 2015 and 2016, here we are four or five years later, and we're still seeing the same thing. So doing something like this is our way to sort of 
get people together, you know, kind of get on the same machine. So we're all working together towards that same common goal. So our smart form is something that's going to standardize that process. As I mentioned, data abstraction can be automated. And by the way, if, if people don't have, you know, electronic medical record, or if they have something different, they can sort of use this and put it in paper form, or they can adapt it to their own sort of electronic medical record. Um, and again, the standardization of the process is what's going to allow us to kind of make um, better conclusions and, and better follow up for our patients. I put this up here. If you are interested in this, um, either Melise Keys and I, you know, we worked a lot on this. And uh, if you can contact either one of us to sort of um, get more information on it. Thank you, Chris. Nice talk. I would like to, to ask uh, Luis Braga. We have about uh, 15 minutes for discussions. Uh, it's nice because the, all the lectures were all uh, talking a different aspect. So we have a lot of subjects to talk. Uh, and uh, also because you, I remember, Luis, when you organized that uh, meeting in Las Vegas with that purpose of making it more uh, like uh, forms like this to get all this information more objectively. So please, uh, you can uh, manage now the moderation. Please. Thank you. Uh, no, it was just, uh, I think uh, they were very, like, no, very nice. Uh, both talks were uh, excellent. I think Ahmed always making the, the link between basic science and explaining why um, he has seen some complications with uh, Snodgrass, uh, the, the tip repair procedure. And I think um, with um, uh, Chris, uh, um, again, I have been uh, working with this database since the 2008 when I left Sick Kids. Uh, so, again, I think the, the important thing that uh, Chris is doing with Meliskis is that um, they have the support uh, from the, hopefully, from the SPU. Um, because you you have to find a way to to get people to to really buy into the system. I think the fact that uh, you have the electronic medical record helps. Uh, but I, I still find that um, and then uh, and maybe some will not believe me, but I, that's the truth because I have lived this for many many years, uh, and because I have failed many times. So you you learn from each failure that you have. Uh, the most important thing, you can even put like, uh, uh, Chris, um, one button for people to, to participate and make uh, the data collection form. But I think um, you have to change the culture. If you don't change the mind and then uh, uh, and give them a reason why they should do it, they will not do it. So until you change the culture, even if it is cumbersome, people will do it. Um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be somebody like in the northeast of Brazil that are very far away. If he's really into doing, he can do it. And then some other people, like in the one of the most prominent uh, universities in the medical school in Sao Paulo and stuff, will not do it because uh, if the reason or the, the mindset is not there. So I think this has to be uh, try to be a collaborative effort. Maybe try to get some uh, push from institutions like you now maybe. SBU uh, or the SIP from Brazil or like the SPU is doing, like what the Europeans did with uh, uh, the, the, the database from uh, Frederick um, van der Torm, like you know that they did a really good job in Netherlands, but uh, ESPU was trying to get it across the uh, Europe, but then the cost was a bit for, for, uh, prohibited. So I think this is my, my two cents. I think I'll, I'll, I'll let it for Masido to open up for questions because that's the most important thing. And one one last uh, word is that Ahmed had asked me about that um, hypospadias survey. So just to give a feedback uh, about the hypospadias, we had 285 responses, and then 135 of them, which was like 47 percent, they, they are currently using preoperative testosterone. Um, most of them are using in the form of a cream, not the injectable one. So just to give a feedback to, to Mark's lecture, which is still um, half and half, and I think this reflects the, co the controversy or the variability in the literature because the papers are all over. Okay, I, I may ask, first of all, I'd like to apologize again for this 100 uh, participants limitation that I wasn't aware. Uh, I somehow thought it was a larger up to 500, but we will overcome this. So uh, 
my excuse for people who try to join. But this meeting will be recorded and will be uh, available soon. Uh, if anyone who is uh, watching the meeting wants to make questions, please do it in the, send in messages. Uh, from the meantime, I see here there's a message from Dr. Paul Jackson from New Zealand. It's addressed to you, Mark. He wants to know about the preferences, uh, testosterone versus the hydrotestosterone. And he also wanted to know if you should uh, do it uh, before three months of age uh, to make it more physiological. We'd like to, to answer to him. Uh, I, I think the beginning of your question was using ointment versus parenteral. Was that the question? No, no, testosterone versus the hydrotestosterone. Uh, Versus dihydrotestosterone. Yeah, 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 DHT. Yeah, DHT. Okay, we Topic. we use um, testosterone and anthenate. Um, it's just what we use. It's cost thirty dollars for a one ml um, vial, so it's the cheapest thing we have, and um, that's what we use. So I don't really. I mean, there's testosterone cypionate and the other one, but I we use the anthenate. Uh, I think the cypionate is the longer acting one. Um, so that's our preference. Um, and what was the other question? I'm sorry. He, he, he asked if you should do it before three months of age. Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't recommend that because, frankly, there's a surge, a natural surge from the infant testis at about three months of age of testosterone. And, and frankly, the average age that I do hypospadias on, assuming I get these babies at birth is closer to eight months of life. So uh, if I see them at birth, I'll see them again at five or six months. And then by the time I get them on the schedule, we usually have about a two month backup. So it works out to be about eight months, but there's, you know, there's really no advantage uh, to operate earlier than six months. I think from an anesthetic standpoint, it's probably a bit safer. Uh, a little later on as opposed to very early. Although technically speaking, it's really the first week of life, which is the highest risk. Um, but from an elective standpoint at our surgery centers, we're not allowed to operate on anybody younger than six months. Okay. Ahmed, we'd like to give your opinion about testosterone free operation. Yes, yes, please. The problem, <clears throat> as uh, uh, Mark mentioned, there are different protocols. Uh, for example, um, Lewis mentioned that 50%, almost 50% use routine preoperative testosterone. Mark, for example, uses testosterone for distal hyperspadia, not for proximal, because he always makes the opening at the coronal sulcus. I, for example, definitely adopt and uh, recommend the use of testosterone in proximal hyperspadias because I want the penis bigger and I want the operation easier. The, there is one issue. Are we using testosterone only for the urethra or should we have long-term thinking and we, as we all know, a small penis at birth would be very likely small penis at adulthood and if we manage to make the penis bigger at birth or at eight months, then we help the child to have a bigger penis. So I, I honestly recommend using testosterone in proximal hyperspadias if the glands width is less than 12 millimeter. And I usually use it, those cases are usually perineal hyperspadias and I give the hormone after the first stage after I correct the corti. I think at least we should use, reach a compromise that we can all follow and be happy with. May I, may I make a comment? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so in, um, what's his name? Uh, from Mayo Clinic, uh, uh, Doug Hoosman did a couple of studies on testosterone and, and originally his first paper came out, he was very concerned about uh, the use of testosterone limiting overall size as they went into puberty, which is kind of the opposite of what you're saying, Ahmed, but 
his, uh, his second paper actually refuted the first one and said that the testosterone usage for the procedure would not in any event, in any way, affect overall growth of the penis. So I don't think you'll get a bigger penis by using testosterone before. I think the size is going to be the size. I think, you know, it's going to shrink down, you know, after several months after you give it. Uh, the one thing I will say is, is when I was in Chicago at Children's there, we used the testosterone ointment. The problem I always had with that is you didn't know how much you were giving. You're smearing this on the penis, and it's, you're giving a variable amount. And that's why I like the intramuscular injection. You're giving an exact amount. I think it's a little bit more uh, objective as to what you're doing. Yes, yes, but Mark, uh, my, my personal experience, if I ask the mothers to use it like a topic, like a cream, like a testosterone ointment, it works pretty well. And uh, if you tell, ask them to use uh, a dose for two weeks, that's what they're going to do. Oh, I'm not, I'm not arguing that, that they don't have any problem using it. Yeah. I just don't know how much is actually being <laughs> absorbed. I see. You know, you, is it 25 milligrams every time they rub it? Is it 10 milligrams? Okay. I have no idea. Yes, okay. I like to, uh, there is a question here, uh, uh, Chris, which you can uh, put your, uh, uh, your, your point here. Uh, also, uh, testosterone use and small glands. Uh, what to do with small glands? Could you address this question, you and Luis too? And then ask uh, the, 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 both of you too. What to do with small glands? And how do, can you think of the technique you're going to use when you have this situation? You not can't hear you, Chris. No, no, can't hear. You're on mute, I think. Chris, you're on mute. Unmute. Okay, I'll make for you. Yes. Again. There we go. Yeah, sorry. Yes. yes. You guys got me now? Yes. So, so in terms of, so I think it depends on, on the cause of the glands. I think if the glands are small because it's a severe hypospadias and it's a proximal hypospadias, uh, if you do a two-stage repair and then um, you lay a, you know, a flap or graft into the glands, and I think that's one way around it. Um, if you're talking about a distal hypospadias, then I think it depends on sort of your techniques. I certainly think that an onlay procedure is something that you can try. Um, that's something, you know, when I first started out, that's kind of more of what I did, but I've migrated more towards, you know, sort of using the local tissue. So I've kind of migrated more towards Mark's camp of getting the glands up to a bigger size, a bigger width, um, doing more of a tier two play. Um, but utilizing the testosterone preoperatively because it really takes a lot of the tension off of the ventral aspect of the repair when you close it. Okay. I'd also like to add one, one thing, a, a compliment to Ahmed because I need the microscope to do my hypospadias and he has much better eyesight than me and just uses his reading glasses. <laughs> I just want to mention one thing. Uh, I, I, I was totally against testosterone three, four years ago. And then I started to use it for small glands. My experience with my patient that the, gland, the penis does not go back to the original size. I'm collecting the data, and, but I'm just waiting to have enough number to publish that. But in my experience, about 80% of the children who has small penis after they receive the hormone, it does not regress back. We're, we're looking at that as well, Abad. We might want to combine our data. Okay. Sure. There is a question to you, Ahmed, here that I noticed. How to avoid uh, diverticula in, uh, in flap surgery? Okay, Please that's take a care very... of your, your microphone, Luis Braga. It's... That's a very, very good question. Um, the only way I do it is that I use several layers uh, at, at the proximal end to reduce it. The most common complications with flaps in perineal hypospadias are glands dehiscence because of small glands and diverticulum. But when you 
use the flap the way I use it and you don't have this sort of obstruction, it is less common than previously mentioned in the 90s, but it still exists. And if it is mild diverticulum, I t teach the mother to massage the penis. And in many cases, this settles the problem. If it is big, I have to open and excise it. And it doesn't come back in most of the cases. I had only to operate on recurrent diverticulum once over the past 10 years. But don't man, you man. think there is a role of uh, distal obstruction, for instance, in the glands area? Well, well, this was the original impression, but I must say I had patients where there was no distal obstruction and they still developed diverticulum. What we need to realize and what I explained to the parents in comparison to the normal urethra where we have a thick layer of corpus spongiosum of muscles, vessels, and nerves, the new urethra that we make is only made of a skin or gras. And that's why there is no muscles or contractile tissue to empty the new urethra. And at the junction uh, where there's an angle of the urethra, this is a weak point where diverticulum may happen. And what I use is just reinforce this area with three, four layers so that it doesn't yield easily at this angle between the membranous urethra and the penile urethra. Uh, uh, um, uh, Antonio, may I make a comment on the diverticulum? Yes. Yes. I think the main issue, one of the reasons why I stopped going into the glands was when we looked at the data, the complication rate of trying to bring the urethra up that extra four millimeters yes. was massive compared to when I left it at the corona. That's right. And the reason why in my mind, and, and very rarely with diverticulum, when I was bringing them up to the tip, very rarely was there an actual obstruction when you calibrated the urethra. The problem is the spongiosum is densely packed. So when you're going up the penile shaft, it's very loose areolar tissue, but when it hits the glands, that spongiosum doesn't distend like the shaft urethral tissue will, so you get back pressure. So even though anatomically there's no obstruction, there's still a physiologic obstruction that's occurring. You get that back pressure, your diuretic and all sorts of problems. So my philosophy has changed in the last several years where I look at proximal and distal hypospadias as two different animals. Distals, I can virtually make perfect all the time. Bring it up to the tip, they do great. They have long-term excellent results. But proximals, the way I look at them now, is I'm not shooting for perfect. I'm shooting for very good. I want to have straight erections. I want them to be able to avoid standing with a, with a well-directed stream. And if they can do that with a coronal meatus, they're very happy. And it also markedly reduces the number of reoperations to boot. So that's just my philosophy. A lot of people think I'm crazy because I'm stopping at the corona, but you know, no, no, no. how many how many times do you I need do to exactly operate on somebody? Have your head beat in about that? I do exactly like you, Mark. And one hundred percent, I agree. Well, I would like to. Uh, we have more five minutes to make it not tedious for the audience. I would like a, a one last remark from each of you. There is just a proposition here uh, concerning cripples, buccal mucosa versus skin as a graft. And I'll let you, any one of you, to make uh, the last remark um, until we can close our, our meeting, okay? So, uh, Luis, can you start? I'll try to unmute you. Uh, yes, please. So, uh, you want a, a final take on uh, redo hypospadias and buccal mucosa grafts? Yes, there is a question here in the, the messages. People are asking uh, the opinion of the faculty, uh, buccal mucosa or skin. And then your last remark. So uh, I'll just, um, so this is just uh, to get um, everybody a chance to speak, I think, uh, and let the, the speakers to, to uh, share their opinions. But what I do uh, for proximal hypospadias, I, I use a two-stage technique. And um, when is a primary care, a primary uh, uh, hypospadias case, which means that they, they, they have the dorsal hood I, I do a first stage perpetual graft uh, repair 
Um, and uh, again, like uh, Mark mentioned and Ahmed, um, uh, I give testosterone to those patients. Uh, one of the, the, the goals of testosterone stimulation is that it's gonna make that uh, dorsal hood much wider and much more vascularized because I'm gonna uh, do a first stage graft using the inner foreskin. So I have a very robust uh, graft that is gonna lay on top of the corpora. So that's number one. Uh, so in terms of uh, using buccal mucosa graft, I only use it uh, oral mucosa for redo cases when I don't have the prep use or the foreskin available. So it would be for uh, a cripple or multiple operations. And then uh, it's like rescue um, that you have to replace that uh, uh, scar uh, or dysplastic or uh, fibrotic urethral plate by a fresh um, oral graft. And my, my first uh, indication is to use the either lower lip or upper lip uh, in younger kids. Uh, in older patients, because of those patients that have uh, redo operations, they are older. So I, I tend to use the cheek because of the, the availability uh, that you can have a longer length. Sometimes not everybody has the Angelina Jolie lips that are very big. So uh, the cheek uh, provides more tissue for, for the, the, uh, the harvest uh, site. And uh, usually you don't need to close that. Uh, I think there was a nice systematic review and people have discussed on those Zoom meetings. You don't need to close the, the site, even it open the heels nicely without any problems. These are my two cents. Okay. Chris, your last remark and comments? Yeah, so I think, I think um, probably just to say something a little bit different. Um, so one of our philosophies at CHOP in terms of reoperative hypospadias is, is utilization of the Cecil uh, modification. Um, and so particularly in redo operations, not for like a simple fistula closure, uh, but something where you need to, you know, when you're going through and they've had three and four procedures and you're really worried about sort of the compromise of the vascular flow, the quality of the tissue there. Um, and that's basically, you know, you go in and, and say you harvest a buccal mucosa graft and then you go through and then you're, you're closing the urethra, um, you know, closing your buccal mucosa urethra. Um, you know, you basically make a ventral incision within the bed of the scrotum. And not to sort of give you extra shaft scan, but really just to sort of allow that buccal mucosa graft, particularly on the ventral aspect of it, where you close it, um, so that you can parasitize that vascularized tissue from the scrotum. And by leaving it in there, what we find is that, you know, that graft really does really well in terms of how it heals, the caliber, um, and just like an even tube all the way through from the distal end down to the scrotum. Now, it adds an extra sort of procedure to uh, the patient's sort of history, um, but at the same time, it kind of goes a long way. So you don't have to have access to hyperbaric oxygen. You know, we're not entirely clear in terms of from an objective sort of evidence standpoint in terms of how well that works. Um, so I think that same thing from, you know, the Cecil standpoint, but what it can give you is it can allow you to sort of get extra blood flow there. So um, what we found is in terms of leaving it in the scrotum for at least a year so that you're not sort of harvesting scrotal skin when you close the penile shaft, so you're not getting that hair bearing skin there. Um, that's maybe a one other modification to sort of prevent that from happening. Okay. Ahmed, like to make your yeah, I announcements would like to as well say... from, from Vienna. Okay, I would like to say three things. I think we, I prefer to use testosterone tailor-made in proximal hyperspadius when the size of the glands is less than 12 millimeter. And I believe according to the data that I have to give it after Cordy correction has better result. The second thing is I believe flaps are living tissue and eventually have better long-term results than grafts. Uh, number three, um, Chris mentioned the scissor technique, which I actually saw Doc Panning doing when I was in CHOP. This is a very nice idea. I to try to move, to take Mohammed to the mountain rather than Moha mountain to Mohammed. So I would rather use the tunica vaginalis flap, bring it up rather than bringing the penis down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So, so three things uh, for me. For the a, the reason why I stopped using testosterone on proximal hypospadias. Very simple. 
First of all, I don't care about the gland size because I'm not going into the glands. But the main reason is when I was giving testosterone, it made the penis so big that when I do a single corporotomy, and this is in contradistinction to some well-known uh, pediatric urologist in our country who believes that you can't get the penis straight with one single corporotomy, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I've been doing this for 35 years, and I can promise you, if you do it right, a single corporotomy, I don't care how severe the cordy is, you can get it perfectly straight. But if I do testosterone, the defect that I have to close with dermis, and some of my partners use tunica vaginalis, but I like dermis because it mimics the quality of the tunica albuginea. So I don't need as large a graft from the groin crease as I would if I was using testosterone. And, and, I, and I agree with Ahmed uh, that I'm a flat person as well, as opposed to a grafter. So in the second, so I prefer to do, bring virus flaps up to the uh, coronal margin and then roll that. And because we're not going into the glands, the chance for diverticks or other issues uh, are minimized. And I use tunica vaginalis as a barrier layer for the second uh, approach. Okay. But what about giving the hormone after you correct the cordy? No, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not going up into the glands. If I was going into the glands, I'll go to the proximal glands corona. If I was going into the glands, for sure I would use testosterone. But otherwise, I don't. I just do a long tear tube. Now, one of the things that Chris mentioned is sometimes after you've done the first stage, uh, there may be a little waist neck deformity at the proximal part of your of your shaft um, just by the way you've done the dissection and unless you do a little plastic procedure where you make a little z plasty and pull that shaft skin down and make it even all the way up uh, that's where the cecil can be beneficial if you run into that problem um, just to give you that extra skin coverage in the future okay I just to make a point concerning small glands, uh, especially in distal hypospadias, where we all are aware that, uh, for instance, the tip repair is not a good uh, technique when you have a small glands. Well, uh, I'll be showing uh, more and more in the future our data with the technique, which is coming out in the Journal of Pediatric Urology, the good technique, where you open the glands in the midline and you mobilize it uh, more or less. This is a, a very interesting alternative uh, for also for variable cases, but especially for these small glands uh, types. With that, I would like to thank all the reviewers from the messages we got. People appreciate our discussions here. It's important that we do not make it very long. Uh, and I think it was very profitable. I'd like to thank uh, Mark, Ahmed, Chris, and Luis. Any message for the HIS Society, Mark and Ahmed, to close the meeting? I would just say that uh, I, I don't know what the future is going to hold in terms of COVID. I'm hoping it ends quickly, but I'm a little concerned. But uh, we're going to have a meeting and discuss whether it may be worthwhile doing this as a virtual meeting if we can't have physical contact at that point. Ahmed? Yes, uh, the meeting is on whether in Vienna or virtual. This, I think this, this will be discussed, but I hope this will be the decision of the executive committee. Yes, and don't forget that next year, with some barbecue, some samba, and some caipirinhas, we have a meeting in Brazil. Eh? So <laughs> before we have in Vienna, but don't forget that next year we get a nice meeting here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah, I'll watch for that. That's with, great. With some excursions to Rio de Janeiro too, okay? Works <laughs> thank, for me. Thank you very much. It was very nice. Thank you for all that participates. And uh, again, my apologize for the limitation, but next meeting we're going to solve this question. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay at home if possible. <laughs> yes, be safe. Bye. Yes, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye everyone. Bye. -bye.